Our next speaker is Lori Patsmore, who did her postdoc here in structural studies starting in 2004, where she used cryo-EM to discover the structure of the ribosome and bound to initiation factors. And then she started up here as a group leader in 2009, so she continued on, where now she's looking at how multi-protein complexes regulate gene expression. Thank you, Kate. And uh, first of all, this has been a really fun day so far, and, and it's really an honor to and pleasure to be here and participate. So my lab here at LMB uses biochemical reconstitution and structural biology to study multi-protein complexes that are involved in gene expression. So um, one of the major um, uh, focuses of my lab is to understand how poly-A tails are added to almost every eukaryotic mRNA in the nucleus. Now poly-A tails are important for efficient translation as well as mRNA stability. So my lab also studies how poly A tails are removed in the cytoplasm. And finally, we study DNA uh, crosslink repair. Now, I'm originally from Canada, but I moved to the UK in 1999 to do my PhD with David Barford. I moved to the UK um, with my boyfriend at the time, now my husband, Matthew Garnett. Um, he also did his PhD at the Institute of Cancer Research. And so in David's lab, I worked on the anaphase promoting complex, or APC, which is a large multi-subunit uh, um, E3 ubiquitin ligase important for cell cycle control. I was using biochemistry as well as cryo-EM to understand its mechanism, but cryo-EM was really difficult then. It was, you know, we were still collecting micrographs on films. We had to uh, scan all the micrographs individually and um, pick all our particles manually. So it was, it was tough. And we, it was the blobiology phase of, of EM. So I decided I needed to come to the LMB to study um, or to learn more about cryo-EM. And so I wrote to Richard Henderson and asked if I could do a postdoc here. And at the time he was the director and um, said, no, he didn't have any time to take on or space to take on any postdocs. But a few days later, Venki Ramakrishnan wrote to me and said that Richard had passed on my email and he was looking for somebody to do cryo-EM in his lab on translation initiation in eukaryotes. So I decided to join Venki's lab. And I, since Venki's lab was doing crystallography, I asked Richard if he would be my co-advisor. And so this was a great combination. I could spend hours talking about the ribosome with Venki and hours talking about cryo-EM with Richard. In fact, I, I usually always made sure I had at least an hour free before I went to Richard's office <laughs> and asked him a question. Venki's lab at the time had, um, uh, more women than men in it. It was a fun place to be. We also, Julie, spent lots of time at the Frank Lee discussing science and other things. Um, and I think we felt like we could do anything scientifically. We had lots of resources, support, and could ask challenging questions. This picture is actually taken with Venki um, uh, in Geneva when he was, um, we were at the Louis Jante award ceremony. Actually, I was seven months pregnant there with, with my first daughter, Kyla, who was born during my postdoc. Sylvie was born two years after I started my lab in 2011. So one of the, another great thing about the LMB was I joined as a, as a young postdoc and KJ Patel used to come and find me in the canteen and ask me lots of questions about E3 ligases. And that's because he worked on a different megadalton sized E3 ligase, the Fanconi anemia core complex. And this was great because he always, he, we used to always have lots of long conversations about E3 ligases. And we said, you know, wouldn't it be great if one day we could study the FA core complex like I had done during my PhD with the APC. And so I'm going to talk today, um, I'll interject with some personal stories, but I'll tell you about the work that we've done on the Fanconi anemia core complex because I think it gives a good example of the support and the, and the projects that we could do at the LMB. So DNA crosslinks occur after exposure to chemicals like chemotherapeutic drugs or alcohol, but also just as a result of normal cellular metabolism. And these DNA crosslinks, of course, block transcription and DNA replication, so they need to be repaired. And if they can't be repaired, it results in human disease like Fanconi anemia or FA. And so at the heart of this FA DNA repair pathway is this megadalton sized E3 ubiquitin ligase called the FA core complex. So in response to DNA crosslinks, the FA core complex adds a mono ubiquitin onto its substrate proteins, uh, FANC D2 and FANC I. 
This in turn recruits nucleases that can excise the damaged DNA and allow the repair to happen. Okay, so really mutation of any one of these components can result in Fanconi anemia. So what KJ and I um, wanted to address was, you know, what are the roles of all of these components, first of all, and why is the ubiquitination so important for cross-link repair? And so KJ worked in uh, the PNIC division and I was in structural studies when I started, well, still today, when I started my lab. And um, we decided to go to Hugh Pelham, who was the director of the LMB and ask if we could have a postdoc that would work cross-divisional between our two labs in a collaborative way to study um, this pathway. And he agreed. So we hired in 2009, um, Eason Regendra to work on this project. Now I would say that, I mean, everyone was supportive about this, but I think lots of people thought it wouldn't, wouldn't really work because it was, it was a kind of challenging project. And I, I say that not, they didn't, they didn't tell me that in a negative way, but more in a supportive way that, you know, this is challenging and it's going to be hard. So what Eason decided to do or was to purify the native FA core complex from cells. And the reason we did that was because we weren't sure if we knew all of the subunits of the complex back then. So this was before CRISP, we knew about CRISPR-Cas9. So he used a chicken DT40 cell line where he could um, genetically modify the cells to add an affinity tag and pull out the entire complex. And so that's shown here. I don't know if I can put this. Uh, in this lane here, he could purify the entire core complex. So we could characterize its composition. We could show that it was active. Actually, the complex was much more active um, than just the isolated ring finger. Um, and we learned lots about how it works. However, it was really challenging and we definitely did not get to cry OEM with this sample. So, you know, in some ways um, they were right and we, we didn't get there um, with this sample. So um, what we decided to do was um, well, actually, Andrew Carter and I used to spend a lot of time talking about science. We still do. We, we, we um, talk a lot about our, the problems in our labs. And we decided that if we really wanted to start tackling these large multi-protein complex and determine their structures, what we really needed to do was make them recombinantly. And so we decided to use a little pool of grant money to hire Gillian Dornan in 2012 to set up a baculovirus facility between our two labs. And so one of the first projects that Jillian worked on was to um, reconstitute the FA core complex from recombinant proteins. So she worked with Eason and what they did was they cloned all eight of the genes encoding the FA core complex subunits into a single baculovirus vector. So then when they used this to infect insect cells, they would simultaneously overproduce all the subunits of the FA core complex um, and they could then purify it in milligram quantities for the first time. So this was really great. The baculovirus facility worked fantastic. And that's now a facility that's core funded and uh, um, overseen by David Bothford and provides um, baculovirus or insect cells to the entire LMB. Okay, so this recombinant complex is active and we were able to determine its structure. It was still hard. The, the complex was quite flexible. We had no known, no, no um, crystal structures of individual components. Um, so Shabby Shaquille joined the lab in two, 2017 to help with the EM efforts. And so we worked with Shores Sheres to um, improve our maps. And we eventually got to a point where we could see all the secondary structures um, and we could actually build atomic models for seven of the eight subunits of the FA core complex. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of the structural details. I'll just give you some of the highlights that we found. One of the really interesting things was, was that there was a, a lot, lot of the subunits were present in multiple copies. And that included the ring finger. And ring fingers are important because they're really the core of the E3 ligase. They bind to an activated E2 enzyme and they facilitate the transfer of ubiquitin onto substrate proteins. So you can see there's a, an L protein here in the base. That's a ring finger protein. And it was really surrounded by lots of other subunits. So its E2 binding surface wasn't free. It wouldn't be available to bind to E2. So we hypothesized that it must be playing a structural role within the complex. On the other hand, the FANC-L up here at the top, 
had a free ring finger that was available and free to bind to E2. So we then hypothesized that the base of the complex would be binding to the substrate and the ring finger at the top would bind to the activated E2 and facilitate sub, uh, substrate ubiquitination. We learned really a lot about the complex and about the role of disease mutations, but a major outstanding question in the field really was why, uh, wh what is so essential about this monoubiquitination event? Why is monoubiquitination and deubiquitination of these D2I substrate proteins so essential for crosslink repair? And um, a crystal structure had been determined several years prior to this by um, Nikola Pavlicic's lab. And so FANC D2 and FANC I are structurally similar proteins. They associate in a back to back mechanism. Um, and, but what was really quite strange about this crystal structure is that the ubiquitination sites of both FANC D2 and FANC I were buried at the dimerization interface. So it was completely unclear how the FA core complex and E2 would um, access these lysine residues and where ubiquitin would even sit when, when the lysines were buried at the interface. And it was also completely unclear why DNA was required um, for ubiquitination. So this is now work done by Pablo and Tamara in my lab. And the first thing that Pablo did was determine a cryo-EM structure of the unmodified D2I complex. And that's, this was done in the presence of DNA. We didn't see any DNA, and it looks almost identical to the crystal structure that I just showed you. Pablo then prepared a monoubiquitinated substrate um, and looked at that, and it was immediately apparent that it had um, completely changed its conformation. So now the, the colors of the subunits will be in, this, in the same as on the left, and ubiquitin is shown here in green. Um, and it, ubiquitin is really wedged in between the two subunits. And what you can see here is that the two subunits have really closed, ha have rotated, they've completely changed conformation and they've closed around DNA and DNA is here in yellow. So because our structure showed that these proteins wrapped around DNA, it showed that this protein was actually a DNA clamp. Okay, so if I superimpose both the unmodified and the ubiquitinated complex, you can see that the, that the um, two subunits rotate by 70 degrees so that they close around the DNA. Um, and so how does this facilitate ubiquitination? If you look at the back of the complex, you can see that um, when DNA, when it bind, the complex binds DNA, it results in the opening of a cleft at the back of the complex. And that cleft contains the lysine that gets monoubiquitinated. So, DNA binding actually closes D2I and exposes um, the ubiquitination site. So just to finish off, I'll show you our current model and how our structures explain both why and how DNA stimulates monoubiquitination. So the FANC D2 FANC I uh, complex binds the DNA. It probably scans around DNA and looks for DNA damage. Um, when it uh, gets to the right place, it um, closes, and that exposes the lysine on the back of the complex. Um, and in work I didn't have time to, I don't have time to talk about today, phosphorylation by the DNA damage kinase ATR primes this phosphorylation by promoting the closed state of the complex. Um, now, you, we also proposed that ubiquitin actually acts as a covalent molecular pin it actually prevents the complex from opening again and from, from leaving the DNA until DNA repair is complete. So that explains why removal of the ubiquitin is also absolutely required for DNA repair because that's required to release it from DNA. Okay, so I think I've, I've mentioned everybody who was involved in this project along the way, but I'd really like to thank all the past and present members for supporting each other and me, and also for being so courageous and tackling these really challenging projects uh, throughout my time. I mentioned my um, supervisors, mentors, and collaborators um, when I started, but I'd also like to mention lots of other people at LMB who've also um, provided advice and support um, uh, throughout my time here, especially, um, especially when my, my children were really young, and um, especially Daniela and Sarah. So uh, thank you for your attention.
this seems to be ubiquitous and is quite distinct from what we're used to hearing about its signal as something for bad proteins to be disposed of. Uh, evolutionarily, do you speculate that this one came first? Oh, uh, I don't know if I can answer that question. Um, I'm not sure, actually. Probably not, I think. Actually, I think, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. But yeah, it is interesting, right? And the fact that actually ubiquitin in this case is stabilizing a protein conformation um, and acting as a signal, it's known to act as a signaling molecule, but stabilizing a protein conformation is actually a, a kind of unique function. Who takes it off? Is there a dub? Is there, there is a dub. Do? Yeah, yeah. There's a specific dub that takes it off. And if you inhibit that dub, it also um, causes major defects in DNA crosslink repair and genome instability. It's not part of the complex, no. It's, it's separate, yeah. You strangely fudged over. Um, it looks for the damage and then changes conformation. Yeah. Is that all known? Uh, how it recognizes, I mean, one can imagine it. Yeah, that's a bit of a white elephant, right? I mean, we we actually, or we don't know, actually, what, we always thought that this would be recognizing the DNA crosslink, but actually we can give it any double-stranded DNA and it works just fine as a substrate uh, in vitro. So, so then the closing we, has nothing to do with recognizing the damage. Yeah, what we think happens is that uh, it's, so our, my current hypothesis is that there's actually not much naked double-stranded DNA in the cells. So this complex will bind any naked double-stranded DNA. That often happens at stalled replication forks. That's one place where you would find naked double-stranded DNA. You also would find at the site of DNA damage, ATR, DNA damage kinase. So the combination of the naked double-stranded DNA um, and ATR, ATR actually phosphorylates it um, and promotes the closure, actually. It closes much more easily when, it, when it's phosphorylated. So we think it's the combination of ATR phosphorylation and uh, just free naked double-stranded DNA in the cell that promotes closure and not actually recognition of the crosslink. 